Thanks very much, Julie. Our next speaker is Netta Zawari, who is a professor in the Department of Political Science at Cleveland State University. She's joining us kindly by Zoom uh, today. Uh, for more than two decades, Professor Zawari has focused on water politics and security. She has deep expertise in transboundary water issues um, and adaptation to climate change in the Middle East and uh, South Asia. Uh, and she's carried out extensive field research in uh, both of these um, areas. Uh, so looking forward to your talk, and thanks for joining us, uh, Netta. So today I'm going to talk about governing the Jordan River system. So let's see. Um, as you know, the Jordan River system is shared by five riparians, um, and it flows through a very arid region. So when you compare the transboundary, this transboundary river, with the other transboundary rivers in the region, you can see what Miriam Lowy wrote in 1993 um, still is um, correct today. By um, In comparison, the Jordan River is a small stream. So let's compare it to the other rivers in um the region. So the Jordan River carries 1,400 to 1,600 million cubic meters per year. If you compare it to the Euphrates, it carries 30 to 35 billion cubic meters per year, whereas the Nile carries 84 billion cubic meters per year. But this stream, the Jordan River, is really important for the riparians that share it, three of them. Israel, Jordan, and Palestine. It is the only perennial river that is available. But there are many problems confronting the Jordan River Basin and the riparians that share it. Um, so in this talk, I'm mostly going to focus on Syria, Jordan, Palestine, and Israel, um, because they're the ones most dependent on it. Lebanon, while it is a riparian, it has alternative sources of water. So one of the problems is natural aridity. The region is semi-arid and arid. So take, for example, Jordan. Um, Jordan is one of the most water-scarce states in the world. If you look at this map right here, this is Amman. And in Amman, you have these tanks on the roofs of houses. And people get water because of the severe shortage. People receive water one day a week, if they're lucky, between 12 to 24 hours. And in this time period, everybody rushes home, they shower, they cook, they clean the house, they do everything they need to do, and then they store water for the entire week. So they have to make do with this water, whatever they're able to store for the week. If they can't, if they run out, they have to go and buy water from private tankers, and that could be prohibitively expensive for the poor and the middle class. So in the municipal sector in Jordan, people are very efficient in their water uses. So if a tap starts leaking, immediately it is fixed um, to conserve water. Uh, Jordan is 97% arid, only 3% is semi-arid. That's predominantly along the Jordan River and its tributary, the Yarmouk River. Um, so the region is dependent on this water and it is arid. The other problem is that you have population growth. Population growth can be natural population growth. And in the case of this region, it's an influx of refugees. So going back to Jordan... You have the natural population growth rate, and then you also have conflict. In conflict-torn Syria, you get a flood of refugees. In um, Palestinians, you've had a flood of refugees from 1948 on. The Iraq War, you get a flood of refugees from Iraqis. And now the turmoil in Lebanon, you also get um, some refugees. So it's expected that the population of Jordan is going to reach 11 million soon, but the water resources cannot meet this demand. In fact, the country runs on a water deficit um, anywhere from 200 to, to 400 million cubic meters per year. Um, the other thing impacting the region is climate change. So within this region, the climate has been transitioning for a while. And through my field research and interviews, um, policymakers have been telling me for a long time, something is happening to the rains. The rains are shifting. 
they noticed this. They noticed the, the droughts were coming more often, that the flash floods were not occurring as much as they used to in the past. Then policymakers um, were sharing this information with us, and then modelers came in and they showed us. In fact, the temperature has increased tremendously. The precipitation rate has declined significantly, and it has shifted away from in, in terms of the Jordan Basin from the north to the south. And the, the problem is that the infrastructure is in the northern part, especially for Israel, the um, water carrier, the national water carrier. The other thing that has happened is that um, the evaporation rate increased. Precipitation is not, it's much more erratic as we've experienced the last couple of years. So what this means is the World Bank expects a 20% decrease in the available water supply um, in this region. So whatever you have is not enough and it's going to get worse. The problem also is that we have mismanagement of supplies. Um, so the agriculture sector, if we look at Jordan, the agriculture sector, they did a great job in the past few years decreasing the amount of fresh water going to the agricultural sector. But... So it's, it's around, um, 55% now. But nevertheless, you still have inefficiencies. So you have in certain parts of the country, the elite overusing the water, having leisurely farms. Um, we have crops that are high demand in water in both Israel and Jordan. We have bananas. We have mangoes that overconsume water. Um, so the water, the limited water supplies that we have still being misused and not used efficiency efficiently. And the other problem that confronting the basin is that it exists in a region of conflict. So in this basin, geopolitics is very important. In the past, water was in some moments sheltered, but it it is vulnerable to the nature of geopolitics in the region. So the message here is that the riparian states are facing increasing demand for limited supplies of water. Now, what I'll talk to you about is that there have been several attempts at cooperation. There's one effort at multilateral treaty, um, bringing all the riparian states together, but then all future agreements on the basin is going to be um, bilateral in nature. And Bilateral cooperation, um, while it seems to be the preference for states all over the world when they're governing um, environmental issues, is actually inefficient. The ultimate path is to get multilateral cooperation or a basin-wide cooperation treaty. So um, between 1948 and 1952, what you had in this basin is what's known as unilateral development. Each riparian state developed attempted to develop the basin to meet its needs. And there were many clashes and bombings. And, and the United States was concerned that this issue would contribute to a conflict in the basin. As a result, President Eisenhower sent Ambassador Eric Johnson to the region to negotiate a settlement to the water dispute. And the the idea was, if we can settle this water dispute, then we can contribute to peace and economic development in the basin. But Eric Johnson had some problems. One, there were these issues that he had to um, mediate between the riparian states. One was quantitative allocation of water. Everybody wanted a bigger share of the pie than the pie was capable of meeting. The other thing is there was the transfer of water. Israel wanted to transfer the Jordan River waters out of basin. Excuse me. And... Um, what the Arab states said is that you needed to meet the water needs within the basin before you can transfer it out of basin. The other thing that Israel wanted to incorporate the Litani River, which flows north, which flows in Lebanon and empties into the Mediterranean Sea in Lebanon. But um, the Arab states said this is a national river belonging to Lebanon and we can't um, include it. The idea for Israel was we can augment the available supply of water in the basin to meet regional needs. The other issue that they were disputing was the use of um, Lake Tiberias or the Sea of Galilee as a storage facility. 
Israel was concerned because it wanted to really protect its sovereignty over the river. And then there was this establishment of an institution, and there were disputes about how powerful this institution can be. So what the literature tells us about treaties, whether they're environmental treaties or they're transboundary water treaties, is that there is a tendency for states to establish a commission and this commission is for implementing the treaty and managing future cooperation in the basin. So after many years of cooperation, uh, of negotiations, excuse me, after many years of negotiations and mediation by um, the U.S., the riparians agreed on some very important things. They agreed to look the other way as Israel transferred the water out of basin. Israel agreed to exclude the Litani River. There was an agreement to use Lake Tiberias um, for storage, and they agreed on quantitative allocation of the river, and they agreed to form an institution. Be given the Arab-Israeli conflict, given the fact that there was no um, rec you know, peace treaty between the riparian states, they took the issue, they took the treaty, and they sent it to the Arab League to accept. The first round, the Arab League said no. Um, and the second round in 1965, the Arab League rejected it. So this, while the Johnson Agreement was never signed, it remains the, it remained the, um, it, it had like a norm whereby each state began to develop the river in terms of Israel and Jordan within the confines of the Johnston Agreement, and all future negotiations started, their baseline was the Johnston Agreement. So although it wasn't signed, it remained um, during this time period an important um, means by organizing um, their management of the water system, but it was unilateral development. Um, so one thing about rivers is that no matter the bilateral relations between states, they impose this need to communicate. At, you know, at the end of the day, you have to communicate. So this is what we get in the Jordan River. 1967 war happens and Israel's borders change, right? Right here, Israel gains access, control over the Golan Heights and its access to the Yarmouk River, which is right here. Um, it flows from Syria into um, Jordan and it connects to the lower Jordan River. Um, so its access to the Yarmouk increased. And after years of lack of negotiations or talking to each other, um, the inlet for Jordan's King Abdullah Canal, which is very important canal that goes from, um, draws water from the Yarmouk. It's parallel to the lower Jordan River, and it's a very important source of water for Jordan. The intake of the canal started choking off because sediments and, in fact, an island formed to clog the river. As a result, by you know 1978, 1979, Jordan um, could not get its share of the water from the Yarmouk, and it approached the United States to mediate a meeting with Israel um, to, you know, to clean the silt in order to improve the flow of water into the King Abdullah Canal. Um, Mayer Ban Mayer, who was a former Israeli commissioner, um, told me, it had this amazing quote about these meetings. So these meetings start developing where Israeli technicians and engineers come and they, and Jordanian, um, technicians and engineers, they come and they meet to dredge the river and divide the water. Um, and this quote reflects the desperation of the time. He says, we met to share a few drops of water to place and move sandbags in the river for our mutual survival. And uh, there are pictures where they're taking a, um, a measurement stick, a, um, a ruler, if you will, and measuring how much water is going one direction and how much water is going the other direction. And they do this until the 1994 peace treaty between um, the states. And what is interesting is that the individuals that were responsible for what becomes an informal institution that evolves with its own um, means of negotiating, in, in, own means of um, addressing conflicts, these individuals are responsible for negotiating the water section of the peace treaty. And in terms of the peace treaty, 
uh, between Israel and Jordan. And um, Article 6, Annex 2, focused on their shared water resources. So the Yarmouk River um, up here, and then you have the Lower Jordan River. And there is a wadi right here that has important water. Wadi Araba in, Jor in, in Arabic, it's Wadi Araba. In Hebrew, it's Wadi Araba. It's right here. Um, so it focused on the shared water resources. It unfortunately said that there's, there are these fixed quantities of allocation, fixed quantities of water that needed to be allocated in the Yarmouk River. And this creates a problem because there are droughts. And um, sometimes there's not enough water in the Yarmouk. And the Yarmouk is actually a tributary that originates and it's fed by Syria. And increased upstream uh, development in Syria meant that the Yarmouk was not, um, it, it didn't have enough water in it to meet demand. So what do you do when you have fixed quantitative allocation? Um, so the Joint Water Commission that was established to um, established to implement these treaty prov provisions and also uh, maintain cooperation in the future, it decided to negotiated a uh, accounting system where balances and deficits could be carried in the future and compensated. Uh, the other thing that the treaty did is that it provided for the construction of projects to augment supplies in the system, such as the Diganya pipe, such as storage facilities in the lower Jordan, a desanalization plant that was supposed to be um, constructed. And then there, it called for cleaning the water in the river, uh, the lower Jordan River from here to here. Uh, Israel also received water in this area from Jordan because it has several kibbutzims that are agriculture communities. Now that we also have bilateral treaties for governing the Yarmouk River between Jordan and Israel. And it's interesting. We have multiple bilateral treaties from 1953, 1987, and 2001. And they negotiate exactly the same thing. So we have the construction of this dam um, on the Yarmouk. And in 1953, the dam was supposed to carry 500, store 500 million cubic meters. By 2001, it was 100 cubic meters. So um, in 2004, when they built it to capture 100 million cubic meters, it, this dam laid empty really until 20. 11, 2012. And the reason it got filled was because of the civil war in, um, in Syria. So it was dam. The, the, uh, the, this, the treaty was over this dam. Also, Syria secured its rights to use the, um, the springs, the well water that are feeding the Yarmouk in agriculture. The area that the Yarmouk River is fed from and flows through is Dira, and that is an important agriculture area for Syria. The other thing is they wanted they established the River Basin Commission, and and this is fascinating. So in 1953, this River Basin Commission was so powerful; it was given monitoring, negotiations, conflict resolution mechanism. As we go through by 2001, um, it loses all its powers and it becomes completely dependent on the leaders for decisions. So the there are consequences to this fragmented governance of a multilater uh, multilateral river system. Um, one is its inefficient management of, of the water. So scientists, engineers, hydrologists, policymakers all tell us that the river should be treated as a unit whereby it's, it's, um, you can consider the ecosystem and the stakeholders and the needs of the people and you manage it together. Here we have fragmented. The other thing a fragmented, um, governance means is that it complicates implementations of existing accords. So, for example, between 2004 and uh, 2011, uh, 2011, the Wahdi Dam laid empty. So that meant that Jordan's commitment to give 25 million cubic meters of water to Israel from the Yarmouk could not be fulfilled. So how do you f comply with one treaty if you, if one treaty is complicating it, right? So it, it leads for the potential of future tension and conflict 
um, over, uh, over a multilateral river. So when you look at the literature in international relations, we, we, it tells us that there are certain incentive structures. Why some states prefer fragmented governance over this, um, multilateral or basin wide cooperation. And, and for this, we can draw on environmental treaties in general, economic treaties. It's, it tends to be what states prefer. So one problem is cost. Another problem is interests. Another problem is uh, power. In terms of cost, it's much more expensive uh, to negotiate multilateral treaties and then to implement multilateral treaties. The more actors that you have, the more challenging it is for to meet everybody's needs. So everybody has different interests. By the time you meet everybody's interests, the idea is that the, the treaty will be diluted and not as powerful. Um, so, and then to monitor and, and sanction multiple states and multilateral treaties, it's much more difficult. So when you have two states and one is cheating, you know which one is cheating. So, uh, and the other problem is that power. We know that powerful states prefer bilateral cooperation to prevent coalitions between weaker states. So if we can go and look at the Ganges and Brahmaputra in South Asia, India has always preferred bilateral cooperation. It has bilateral treaties between India and um, Nepal and India and Bangladesh. And it, the preference here is to prevent a coalition between Nepal and, and Bangladesh against India, which would um, de decrease the ability of India to um, meet its uh, interests in the treaty. So this is what the literature tells us why we tend to get fragmented cooperation. So s some conclusions. One, despite a history of animosity and conflict, some riparian states manage to reach agreements or treaties over their shared water resources. So we do have treaties, even though this is a conflict-torn state. The Johnson Plan was always a baseline used during negotiations between states. The other issue is climate change means that we're going to confront a water crisis in this region. And geopolitics, until today, remains important. So unfortunately... Um, the relationship between the Prime Minister Netanyahu and King Abdullah is not great. So during a time period, um, prior to this current regime changes in the last three years, uh, water became hostage to, to the relationship between them. So as, as tensions rose, um, the ten there were tensions over water, which you didn't see prior to Netanyahu. So geopolitics remains very critical. As Israel expands its capacity to decentralize water to meet its domestic needs for water, it will have a direct impact on the future of the Jordan River Basin. So um, right now, Israel is uh, in the process of having the um, national water carrier move water to the Bahir uh, Tabaria or the Sea of Galilee and to rehabilitate the Jordan River as um, the peace treaty called for. It also means that Jordan is going to start buying more decentralized water from Israel. And then um, there is this, we can talk about later, there is um, a letter of intent that was signed between Israel, Jordan, and the United Arab Emirates, whereby Jordan buys 200 million cubic meters of water from Israel, and then um, Israel buys solar energy from um, Jordan. Thank you very much. It's uh, fantastic, and thank you so much for joining us uh, as well. Um, questions, discussion from the audience? Hi, Neda. It's David. Hello. It's David Katz. Hi. <laughs> um, first of all, I hope you feel better. Thank uh, you. <laughs> and thanks for joining, even though you're sick. Uh, so, I mean, you, you laid out a, a, a long list of reasons why it's, it's inefficient, uh, but also reasons why it, it might be efficient. I mean, why, why, they, why they choose it is, is maybe actually for political efficiency. 
right? So it's, it's not efficient in terms of basin management, but in terms of, of actually getting things done. Um, given that, that there are no direct relations between uh, Israel and Syria, given that there are not great relations between Jordan and Syria, and given, rela- given that there's, there's not really solid control within Syria over, over some of the, the regions, um, how would you suggest that, that things be done otherwise, I mean, in the basin, in, in terms of having more inclusive basin management? I mean, is it, is it even feasible to, to, to talk about something like that for this basin? Okay. Sorry. All right. Um, so in terms of that question, um, I think what's – so I'll address right now what's happening right now in – the it seems that Syria is in the process of interest in entering a um, the post conflict reconstruction period. The Arab states appear to have embraced Bashar and Assad, and they have interest in um, stabilizing Syria. So there is an incentive for a multilateral treaty in the future because what happens is as Syria settles, it's going to need to use the agriculture sector to meet its internal food security needs to settle people. And as a result, the Yarmouk, the um, the dam right now has about 100 million cubic meters um, in it. It's, it's full. Um, and, and that's going to disappear. So, and droughts. And Israel has developed this desinalization capacity. And it can, in effect, you know, sell water to the region. Um, I think given a mediator, maybe I'm too optimistic, uh, that there, there are potentials in the future for multilateral. You're right. In the past, there was no, I mean, it was, it was quite difficult. Uh, Hafez al-Assad, he tried to, um, negotiate a multilateral treaty. Um, I mean, sorry, a bilateral treaty with Israel to settle his dispute with Israel, but that fell through. I was told when I, um, met with negotiators at the time, Hafez al-Assad is the, the father of Bashar al-Assad. I was told that, that they settled the water dispute. Um, during these negotiations, but at the last minute they collapsed. In terms of multilateral, definitely it is caught up with the, um, Arab Israeli conflict and, and it's, it's very difficult. Definitely. Very good. Other questions? Yes. Hi. Um, in the beginning you listed, I think it was about five different critical areas that I think were hampering the ability uh, to, uh, you know, uh, share the water or provide a, sus- a sustainable reality for, uh, you know, the, the water supply and so on. Is there one or two in particular that have the highest degree of impact? You know, for example, is it the geopolitical? Is it the mismanagement? Is it climate change? Can you talk a little bit about how you might rank some of these in terms of their priorities? Okay. Uh, can I go back to the slide? All right. Um, it's really hard to do that because they all work together. So, for example, I mean, it's an arid region. There's just not enough water in it. And uh, desanalization, if you look at the case of um, Israel, and I'm, I'm Professor um, David Katz is, is, can tell us a lot more about this, but um, desanalization changed the equation. But it's not a possibility for Jordan because Jordan has a small port, the Red Sea port, and then to build a desanalization plant there and then transfer the water to Amman, that's... Um, it's prohibitively expensive for a poor nation like Jordan. So it's there's just not enough water in the region. I mean, that's a very important factor. And then if you want to combine climate change on that, the region is getting drier. Not enough water is coming. Precipitations are, are it's decreasing. Evaporation is increasing. So the water supply is, is not what it used to be. Um, 
And then mismanagement. Certainly we have mismanagement. Whereas the municipal sector in Jordan is very, I mean, the middle class and the poor, they're very efficient in the amount of water that they use. Every single drop for them counts. In Israel, unfortunately, there is um, overconsumption in the municipal sector, if you will, and they can be much more efficient in the municipal sector. Go back to Jordan, the agriculture sector, uh, certainly both Jordan and Israel can be much more efficient. And also, for example, in Jordan, there is uh, the there is a lot of leakages in, in in the water distribution system. So the water distribution system is old; it needs to be maintained. And also, we have the elites all you know within the whole region, you know, having swimming pools and washing their cars and have you know it's just inefficient and having having leisurely farms. But the elite is a small percentage. But nevertheless, that's amount of water that you can save. In terms of geopolitics, I think geopolitics impacts the management between states. It's it's an important variable. I I think things worked better when you could isolate water from from geopolitics. But um, I, I, geopolitics, nevertheless, is an important variable. So if I were to order them, I would say, yeah, aridity is really critical. And then climate change is critical. And then mismanagement and then geopolitics. Thank you. Would you? Uh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Okay. No. no. Um, so mismanagement of supplies. That it's to be fair to everybody that exists in Israel and that exists in Jordan and that exists in you know everywhere you go. So mismanagement is an internal political issue um, for all states. I mean, I can say the same thing about India. I can say the same thing in the United States um, at the Rio Grande in the Colorado River. We have problems there in the United States. So mismanagement is tied to state society relations. I know when I was um, Nolga Blitz, who worked at the um, water commissioner's office in Israel, she was part of um, the early 2000s. She managed the water resources in Israel and in Jordan, and, and, and I'm sorry, and in the Joint Water Committee and was negotiating with Jordan. And she told me that when they were taking fresh water away from farmers, farmers were literally knocking down on her door yelling at her. Okay, so water water is inherently a domestic political issue. So it, I I think um, geopolitics is critical, probably more so for Jordan because um, it has little power and it's highly dependent. It has very limited supplies of water. So geopolitics have more influence on Jordan's ability to meet its water security needs. Um, and it is, there's at the moment, asymmetric interdependence on water in the Jordan Basin. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Netta. Uh, great discussion and terrific uh, presentation. Let's thank Netta again for her presentation. Thank you.